Today, we're going to be ranking Battlefield 5's current map selection from worst to best. And there's a few different reasons why I'm choosing to do this now, rather than having done it previously, right after the Panzerstorm map released in December. First reason, we're now in May 2019, and that is the month where the first new multiplayer map for six months is going to be releasing for Battlefield 5. Number two, conveniently, the Battlefield 5 community survey for April featured a section asking players to rate each map in the game from a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the best and 1 being the worst. And number three, I've waited for a significant period of time to pass since all of the maps were released, the ones that I'm ranking anyway, to make sure that I'm through that honeymoon period where everything is wonderful and lovely, and I'm now in a place where I can be much more objective. Now, I'm pretty confident that the way that I'm going to rank these maps will be wildly different to some of you guys out there and how you'd rank them, and that's likely because we have very different expectations, wants and likes, from our Battlefield maps. So after you've heard my list and where I'm going to rank things, I'd love it if you guys could share your ranks down below in the comments section as well, and I'll leave a link to the community survey in the description so that you can go and answer directly to EA and DICE, letting them know what you think and sharing your opinion. Okay then, let's get the ball rolling. I'll start by working from the maps that I like least, all the way up to the ones that I like the most, giving them a score out of 10. And first of all, Hamada. This is not a map that I particularly enjoy, but that's almost certainly because the map isn't geared towards playstyles and roles that I really like to take on. It's a heavily vehicle influence map, and that's a classic combination of air combat, ground armor, and infantry gameplay as well, but its huge size tends to water down the infantry experience between the capture points, making it a map that I tend to try and play quite zonally. The string of flags across the middle, B, C, and D, I think they offer the best infantry experience with plenty of opportunities to engage with enemy players. That ruined fortress that's at the top of the map across the bridge, that's also a good place that infantry can thrive, but during conquest rounds, this area just isn't hot enough to really warrant spending my time there. This map on front lines is far too big for the number of players the mode supports, and on breakthrough there's too many sectors, and not enough reinforcements for the attackers to really make a huge amount of progress. The lack of solid cover, large, long lines of sight, and heavy vehicle focus makes it a map that I try and avoid, even with its switch away from Conquest Assault back to standard Conquest in a recent patch. That didn't really do much to change things, in my opinion. Hamada gets a 5 out of 10 from me, and it sits right at the bottom of the ranking. Next up, we have Rotterdam, and that might surprise some people if you know what my gameplay style is like. And for any of you that follow me on Twitter, you'll know that I really like to complain about this map, probably once every couple of weeks or so. And that's mainly because this map just sucks all the life out of the battle. It fails to really produce any atmosphere, and I think in Battlefield 5, this is the map where all sound just goes to die. That might have been a bit extreme as an opinion, but the map just doesn't really feel like it's set during World War II. Sounds like gunfire in the distance, tank shells being fired, explosions, all those things that you expect from a battlefield map, they just seem to get absorbed up and they're muffled, they're really muted. The battle that's taking place is on the eve of the city being bombed by the Germans, and according to the level designers, Rotterdam is supposed to represent the calm before the storm, with the storm then laying waste to the area and being completely obliterated. That's all well and good, but it just doesn't really feel like a massive German force is advancing on the area, trying to take everything with it. The bright blue skies that you've got, the muted ambient noise, the sunshine, it's just too happy. It's a massive juxtaposition. You've got massive mechanized war in a seemingly idyllic setting. For me, that just doesn't really feel right. Besides the setting, sadly, I do actually enjoy the gameplay quite a lot. The urban setting with its blocky layout of solid buildings, flanking the more open canals, that's one I can really get behind. Being a fan of maps like Sen Crossing in Battlefield 3 and Amiens in Battlefield 1, but I just can't stop thinking about how greatly improved the atmosphere could be. 
And for that reason, Rotterdam only scores a 5 out of 10 in my ranking. It's a map that could be utterly amazing, and in many places the clash of infantry and ground vehicle combat is very good, but there's no atmosphere here whatsoever. I'm expecting something really hard and gritty, dark, rain everywhere, wind, decreased visibility if you want to even go that far, although in Battlefield 5 maybe decreasing visibility wouldn't be such a great idea, but I just don't feel like I'm fighting a war here on Rotterdam. Rotterdam is the library of Battlefield 5. It's far too quiet in my opinion. Up next we have Fjell 652, the infantry dominated Norwegian mountaintop that also plays host to a massive skybox and that allows pilots to dogfight their way to victory or to loss as the case may be. Those pilots up there have no real way of playing the objective points up in the sky. Fjell, I think, was designed with the same sort of intent as Argon Forest in Battlefield 1. A limited number of lanes between each capture point creating natural clashes of infantry at various locations across the map. This time, however, the map is wider in its design and it supports several flanking routes that can be taken to break the two front lines clashing together. I like that the mountain itself is used to create these different paths, and with a few choices to take from each objective location, you can choose to engage or avoid engagements with the enemy team in most scenarios, and that can have a massive effect on the flow of the map at different points during a match. However, the capture points themselves are massively underwhelming, and there is a heavy reliance on players building fortifications on the capture points to aid their defences. The cover on offer is almost all destructible, and that to me poses several issues. I think Fortifications is one of the best additions to the Battlefield franchise in a long, long time, but in some cases the emphasis placed upon them is far too great, and many locations would benefit from more solid, indestructible cover instead. Previous Battlefield games relied on this more permanent placement of cover to help guide gameplay in a certain way, and in some cases, I believe Battlefield 5's map flow and design is comparatively weaker overall compared to previous games because of the heavy reliance on players to build their own cover. Indestructible cover provides permanent structure to a location, and it gives you several ways to approach combat in a more predictable way. You can manipulate solid cover to your advantage, maybe you can get an angle on an enemy, and then defending locations becomes much more rewarding. Fortifications, in my opinion, shouldn't be used as a replacement for what would have previously been solid cover. Fortifications should be used as an extension to that cover, and as a way to provide cover when those destructible parts, placed there by the level designers, have then been destroyed. And this is why Fiel suffers in my eyes. There's too much destructible cover, there's not enough solid cover. I'm rating Fiel a 6 out of 10, as it gives me the infantry focus setting that I like, but the forgettable flag locations and the lack of solid cover really hurt the experience, especially towards the end of rounds. Just above Fiel, we have Aerodrome. I think the long lines of sight and generally flat layout of the map hurt gameplay flow, and that results in teams getting stuck on objective locations quite easily. But the reason I'm placing it above Fiel is because one of its objective locations stands out as a proper map landmark, and that's the hangar in the middle. Being completely indestructible, apart from the static vehicles placed inside it, the location offers that predictable arena that combat can thrive in. The long corridors either side of the main room, that allows teams to fight it out for dominance of the entire location. The catwalks above the main room allow players to launch attacks on vehicles that might enter. And the large open doors at either end, they allow vehicles to come into play, just splurging bullets and shells into the chaos within. Combat in this location doesn't stop, it's always happening for the entire round, and usually the flag will change hands multiple times, always giving you a reason to go back there and fight for your team. It's the rest of the map that's extremely forgettable on Aerodrome, and just like Fiel, it suffers from a lack of more permanent cover and an overpresence of destructible cover. Fortifications are again used in place of that destructible cover, instead of being a supplement to it. 
Gameplay becomes more and more stagnant as rounds progress, with lines of sight opening up because of what little cover there was being destroyed, and by the end of rounds the map turns into a recon player's paradise. I'll still rate Aerodrome as a 6 out of 10, mainly because of the awesome hangar location in the middle, but it's a map that with some further work from DICE could be a really good one. Right now, it's not that great. Getting into the middle of the pack now, we have Narvik. This was the first map that players could play in Battlefield 5, being available in the alphas and open beta, and by the end of the open beta, I was ready to play another map and never return to Narvik. I'd overplayed it far too much. However, after avoiding it for the first month or so after Battlefield 5 launched, when I did go back, I found it to be a good overall experience. The town area is just brilliant for infantry to thrive in, and the train yard with the elevated wooden walkway as well, that's really good too. The vehicles integrate nicely with lots of different paths for ground vehicles to take, and the presence of planes in the sky is a threat for pretty much anything moving on the ground. But again, I tend to find that air vehicles have very little effect on the outcome of matches on this map. I know that Narvik was one of the first maps worked on for Battlefield 5, something I found out at Game Changer events at the DICE Studios, and with the different capture points all being very unique and attractive, you can see the extra development time really went to good use. Overall though, Narvik just doesn't give me the wow factor. I'm fighting on the shores of Norway, I'm trying to stop the town from being overrun, and I just don't feel like there's any sense of urgency being placed upon me. Maybe again, it's the happy sunshine weather that's detracting from that feeling of war, but the gameplay itself does flow quite nicely. Narvik gets a 7 out of 10 for being a good map, but not a fantastic or truly memorable one. Moving on now, and falling just short of a podium finish, we have Panzerstorm. This is the only post-launch map to have launched so far for Battlefield 5. Panzerstorm is the product of reusing assets from the Twisted Steel and Arras maps to create this huge sprawling battlefield, where ground vehicles definitely take the centre stage. Considering then I wasn't a fan of Hamada, and that map very much does the same thing with ground vehicles taking centre stage, why is it that I like Panzerstorm so much? Well, initially, I didn't like it. When it first launched, the wide open spaces between the capture points themselves, they were really, really bland, and the capture points were uninspiring. There was no incentive for me to go and capture them because they supported very little in the way of engaging gameplay opportunities. Then, DICE took over the map, they went back in-house with it, and it went for a makeover, and it got some much-needed tweaks. The addition of more soft cover, they elevated some ground around the open sections, created more ditches and more mounds to provide some infantry cover, and they even completely remade one of the objective points, and they extended the tank trap line right across the centre of the map, and I think those things massively improved gameplay for vehicle and infantry players. The line across the middle of the map that connects B, C, D and E capture points, that makes for this brilliant string of infantry gameplay. Players can move back and forth for control of the map. And then the outer flags, they make for brilliant vehicle battlegrounds. Much larger footprint overall on some of those objectives. There's just a lot more space out there for those guys to move around. Due to the map's sheer size, however, I think the map does suffer with a bit of traversal boredom. If you're an infantry player and there's no spare Kettengrad or light vehicle about, then you're going to be doing a fair bit of running to get to the next objective. The wide open fields also force vehicle players to stick together in little packs as well. I often see two tanks rolling in a pair for safety, and that can be cool if you're in the tank devastating enemy players, but it's not so much fun for the players on the receiving end of that. So, just like Narvik, it's one of those good maps overall, but it's not a brilliant one. Panzerstorm gets 7 out of 10. Okay then, moving into the top three. Taking the bronze medal, we have Twisted Steel. This is the map that we saw, albeit in a different stage of its development, during the now infamous reveal trailer for Battlefield 5, and despite that trailer completely missing the mark when it came to tone and audience, it did at least pave the way for what I think is a really good Battlefield map. The huge half-destroyed bridge is clearly the centre point of the map, and it becomes the focus for infantry gameplay almost every single round that I play through. 
It ties in the swamp location below quite nicely by dropping down to a flag located in the destroyed section of the bridge. And this is one of the key locations where ground vehicles are really able to influence the battle. Air vehicles, especially the bombers, can have a huge impact on this map as well. With the different capture areas offering different types of enemies to target, either infantry or vehicles, those planes can start strafing along the bridge to cause large impact on infantry gameplay, or they can head across the swamp targeting tanks and they can stop the firepower moving towards the next objective. In general, Gameplay here on Twisted Steel is a really nice mix, and the huge bridge is just one of those elements that sticks in your brain. It helps you remember this map really easily. Twisted Steel gets 8 out of 10, and it gets a hat tip for the use of fortifications as additions to cover, rather than completely replacing it. DICE did really well with this one. Taking the second spot and the silver medal, we have Devastation. Now, of all of the maps in Battlefield 5 at the moment, this one suits my playstyle the best. But there is just one thing that stops it from taking the top spot. What I really like is the cathedral in the center. It dominates the combat and it condenses infantry down into a tight space, but it doesn't make the map feel like a meat grinder. There's a lot of different paths inside, solid cover blocking lines of sight, with plenty of shelter for infantry. And then around the outside, there's lots of entry points again, allowing you to flank and potentially surprise enemies. The outer objectives on the map, they're all themed really nicely. And again, they make brilliant use of solid cover. That makes gameplay more predictable and defense of those objectives much more rewarding and entertaining. Battlefield has really suffered when it comes to defensive gameplay in the last couple of iterations. Players only seem to want to attack in this day and age. But in my opinion, Devastation subverts that direction completely and it makes it fun to hold onto places with well-designed capture points. I particularly like the library section with its multiple levels and entry points onto the flag. If you try holding that with a few friends when a group of enemies is attacking you, you're gonna have a good time. Trust me on that one. The one thing though that holds this map back is the really poor soldier visibility that Battlefield 5 suffers from in general, and I feel really sorry for Devastation because its setting just doesn't lend itself to good visibility anyway, so it's hurt even more than other maps in the game. The dark roads and alleyways and the poor soldier lighting mixed in with those muddy camo clothes that means enemies can almost hide in plain sight, and that makes gameplay frustrating at times. If you add into the equation the presence of several prone bipod MMG players every time you play on this map, attacking objectives that you think might be clear becomes even more frustrating. Now I know that DICE is still working on improving soldier visibility, and another update to it will be coming out in the near future, which will hopefully cure the problem once and for all, I've got my fingers crossed, but until that point I can't rate Devastation as highly as I'd like to. This map gets an 8 out of 10 for being almost pure infantry chaos built around some really interesting capture points. And so then, my gold medal and the top spot goes to Arras. This, I think, is probably the map that best collides the different types of combat that Battlefield 5 supports. Infantry can thrive in the central village. That also makes great use of destruction, solid cover, and supplementary fortifications as well. I really like the town section. Ground vehicles, they can roam around the outskirts of the town, capturing and contesting the outer flags. There's a bit more room out there to move around. But they can also engage with infantry as well. Soldiers can use the tall grass to pretty much hide in plain sight, but they're gonna need to team up with a few friendlies to take down those heavier tanks a bit quicker. This usually leads to some good back and forth moments around the edges of the map. Vehicles can also venture into the town as well, creating their own pathways with most of the buildings being partly destructible, and infantry can then use the solid parts of the houses that are left over, and that stops the location from being completely leveled, and it allows gameplay to keep flowing much further on into the match. 
air vehicles also integrate really nicely as well, as visibility of players and vehicles is nice and clear on this map, mostly because of the contrast of those bright yellow fields. Dropping bombs and doing some strafing runs on both the town in the middle and the outer objectives is likely going to result in plenty of kills and a big disruption of the gameplay there, and that can sometimes help swing captures back in your team's favour. This is maybe the only map where I'd say planes have a direct impact on the score of the round, because the infantry and ground vehicles aren't spread so far apart here. They're condensed down just enough to make bombing runs worth it on flags that are being contested. I've got to say, whoever designed Arras, they did a brilliant job. This map gets a 9 out of 10. Now, as I said at the start of this video, it's very likely that you guys will all have your own scores for these maps, so if you want, you can drop all of your scores down below in the comments section, and then you can compare and see what other people in the community are thinking. And if you want to give your scores directly to DICE, make sure you fill out that survey that I've linked in the description. DICE didn't directly say what they would do with the data, but in my head, if you collect data, that's either to inform improvements to those maps that you want to make, a bit like the improvements to Panzerstorm, or you're going to use that data when building new maps in the future. Either way, if you want to contribute, go and fill in that survey. The bit about the maps is towards the end, so answer the first few questions, and then you can give all of your scores at the end of that survey. But a big thank you for watching today. I know this was a long video, but if you stuck all the way to the end, you're awesome. Thank you very much. And until next time, my name is Westy, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.